thanks everybody. And again, I do apologize for my reduced voice, so I hope you can, anyone can hear me tell me. Uh, this is a talk I've actually wanted to do for some time, and I'm very grateful to MNS and SBC for giving me the chance to do it. And it goes back, I guess, to a few years ago when I was in Cuba National Park with David Bakewell. And David started to point out to me the different kinds of dragonflies we were seeing. And I've known about dragonflies for a long time, but I'm a bird person. And I haven't paid them the kind of attention, but I told the dragonfly that says, And I suddenly noticed that you can actually, in much the same way as you can do with birds, you can tell the different kinds of birds. And some of them were extremely beautiful, easy to watch. And something inside went, wow, this is really neat. This is a an aspect of nature that is so similar to what we birders do, or we do with the birds that I haven't explored. And that got me going in various parts of the world, and I discovered back home in Canada that a lot of people who have been bird watchers for many years are now becoming very enthusiastic dragonfly watchers. And I think, you know, I've always felt that Sarawak has so much to offer different areas of nature. And even some of us who are very interested in they just fail to notice some of the very right around us. The purpose of this talk is to get control of this subject. You're going to see a lot of detail I don't expect you to absorb. I'm not a dragonfly biologist, I'm hoping to have a lot of more than how to do it. This is a talk from basically an amateur, which I am, to people who I think would find this as fun as I do. So, drag, not dragonflies and damselflies, but dragonfly and damselfly watching. Now, those of us who got me, we see some other words called Oli, which is a terrible word. But it's because dragonflies, there's no one word for dragonflies and damselflies to take together. Other than the technical word odonata, which is the group they belong to, so for odonata we call odon. But nonetheless, it's a new way to enjoy nature, and that's not just for watching, it's for photography. Uh, most of the photographs in here are mine, and I don't think we a fantastic photographer. The dragonflies are wonderful photographic subjects. A lot of them have the very nice habit of scaring them for coming back and seeing the exact same spot. Again. So, why go Odis? Actually, I'm doing this in uh, Sumatra, but I actually am looking at dragonflies that may not be. First of all, they are everywhere. It's one of the things about dragonflies, it's like birds. You don't have to go very far to find them. There are lots of them right in the city of Chin, dragonflies and dancerflies, particularly dragonflies here. Uh, Anywhere there's water, there are always a few species around, in drainage ditches, in people's yards, uh, some that I've taken to call ditch dragonflies, because that's the commonest place to find them. You can find them everywhere. Here's a nice thing. Dragonflies, like so many other insects, need to warm up because they start the day not warm like an animal. So they don't get really active until around night. Which means that once the birds start flying down and say, now what do we do on a nature walk? The dragonflies are just getting going. So you can be birding in the morning, in the early morning, and boating in the late morning. Most, not all, are easy to learn. Once you learn a few basic tricks of the trade, which is you may have done when you started birding, once you learn some of the things to look for, and we'll talk about those, you should be able to identify pretty well most of and many of them, as I've just said, hold still. Again, unfortunately, they don't hold still. Now, and also another thing I might add is that unlike groups like beetles, where there are tens of thousands of species, there really aren't that many. The numbers of bird and dragonfly species are about similar to the number of bird species, more or less. So you don't have to learn thousands and thousands of different ones. You learn in the whole of Borneo, there may only be about 300 plus species. It's a, it's a learnable group. So let's take a look at the Odonatans, which is the dragonflies and damselflies, the law. Uh, so here we have 
two damsel flies and three dragon flies. You'll see these again later, so I won't give you the names. But they're very beautiful. The thing you should get from this slide is that these are beautiful and colorful animals. These are not just little dull things you see flying from the time. And as I said, two main groups, the Zydoptera, which is the damsel flies, and the popular and the Anisoptera, which are the dragon flies. There's another group called the Anisozydoptera, but it's only got three species and it doesn't occur in one as you can forget. At least for now. Now, a long time ago there was another group. This was millions of years, but this is a little bit of interest. That have been called griffin flies. They are the mega anisoptera, which means mega big. They lived around 300 million years ago. Often you'll hear people talking about them as giant dragonflies. They're not, they're dragonfly colors. The true Odonatus showed up about 230 million years ago. That's in the class. That's a note when the dinosaurs were getting old. So dragonflies and damselflies we have today are about as old as the dinosaurs. And since dinosaurs are bird ancestors, then there's another thing called dragonflies. Now, as I've said, some of the fossil native dinosaurs were bigger than the dragonflies we're likely to see here. <coughs> now that's a model, of course. That's how big they were. That was back before there were any other flying animals, no other birds, no birds, no bats. So, how do you tell, first of all, a dragonfly from a damsel? Well, you've got a dragonfly here at the top. And as a fly in your club. Dragonflies are usually larger than damsel flies, or at least more heavy body. They're a very long body Basically, that is the They hold, they, when they perch, they hold their wings outstretched. They can't hold their wings over the back. The only time a dragonfly has its wings folded over its back when they come to this is when they first emerge from the larva shell when they're coming out of the water. And it takes them about maybe an hour before they can open their wings. But once the wings are open, they are stuck, stuck that way. They can't fold. So that's and the wings are of unequal size. That means that the four wings, the front wings, and the hind wings are not the same size. The hind wings are a little bigger. And that's what the word anisoptera actually means. Teron means a little The damsel wings tend to be small, some very small. They tend to be very slender body, and not all of them, of They can fold their wings, and most of them do hold their wings folded over their back, and that's about the best way to look right at something and say, which is it? There are some exceptions, which I'll show you. But damselflies, even if they do hold their wings out, can hold them over their back. Damselflies, dragonflies, cannot. And their wings are an equal size. The four wings and the hind wings, the front and back wings, are the same size, and that's what zygoptera means. Zygo means an X equal teron. Another way to tell most dragonflies from dragonflies is to look at their eyes. Now, dragonflies, most dragonflies have enormous eyes. You see these huge, huge structures. These are the compound eyes. They have a few smaller, little, simple eyes to go to the main. They're enormous. In fact, this is so dragonflies can see almost 360 degrees around themselves. But you'll notice that the eyes meet in a seam along the top of the head. The eyes actually touch. Now that's not true of every dragonfly. One group of dragonflies we have here in Borneo, where the eye, if you see in the middle, where the eyes don't meet, but they're still very large. In damselflies, the eyes never meet. And you can see here these little black dots. These are the simple eyes. These are the big colors. So this is a damselfly, that's a dragonfly, and that's a dragonfly too, so you need to be really careful with the eyes when it's a good one. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the natural history of these animals, but I think you should know what they're doing. They start life in the water. That can be in a river, a puddle, a uh, pond, a lake, or any body of water. The dragonflies lay their eggs in the water, 
and the eggs hatch into this wingless round thing, which is called a nymph or larva. And that can live under the water, in some cases a few months, in some cases for two or three years. They will live under the water. Then, when they get to the point where they're ready to become sexually mature, they climb out of the water, usually early in the morning, sometimes onto a plant, sometimes on the side of the building or a rock, and the skin splits open, and out comes the adult dragonfly or fly, which sits on the skin, which is called a fancy word for called an assume, and um, wait until they sort of dry out, their wings pump up, and the dragonfly and wings snap out, and then off they go to find mates and to lay their own eggs and start over. And a dragonflies can live, some species only live a few weeks, some live several months as adults. But they spend more of their lives in the underwater nymph stage than they do as adults. But the ones you will see 99% of the time, unless you're really looking hard, will be adults. And they are sexually mature state. Adult for an insect. <laughs> So 
this damn supply of Brazil. We saw this one, it just about swooped down, grabbed it, and was chewing on it as I programmed it. Now, a little bit about the mating habits of the Odonata, because they're strange. Now, a lot of damn flies and some dragonflies are very territorial. They will either uh, patrol up and down the middle stream, or they will have a perch that they sit on and to keep an eye on a stretch of water and they'll chase off any other male who comes into the area. Now, what I'm showing you here is a kind of damselfly that is actually pretty common on streams in this area. I uh, photograph these uh, near Matan. It's called Heliocyphal by Syriata. Don't worry about the names just yet. And they have these little aerial tools that fly up and they, in effect, go head to head and they flash these little metallic patches on them. They flash these little metallic patches on their wings at each other very brightly. And some of them also have white legs, that they can, yellow legs that they also use. And these are bluffs, in effect. They don't actually fight. But they are sort of saying, I am bigger and handsomer and better looking and more colorful than you are, get lost. <laughs> and uh, these can, some, in some of these damselflies, they can keep this up for hours. It's over and over and over again. Now, once we get around to mating, we get into some really strange stuff. Now, most insects mate in the way that you would think would be the normal way for insects to mate. That is, they put their genitals together, usually at the back of the abdomen. You've probably seen butterflies do this or other insects. And sperm is transferred from the male to the female. Well, dragonflies and damselflies don't do that. They have evolved a very peculiar system of mating, and we'll come to why in a minute. What happens is, and this is actually important for identification too, as it's later, the male does produce sperm in a little packet at the end of his abdomen. But he doesn't transfer it directly to the female. What he does is he deposits it in a little pack underneath the base of the abdomen. This is called a secondary sexual organ. And it's got something that's the equivalent of a penis on it. Then he looks around for a female. And when he finds one, he grabs her behind the head with a pair of what are called claspers or cerci that are little projections. I'll show them to you at the back of the abdomen. Wraps are like this. And they are then what is called in tandem. And then the female, in order to get the sperm from the male, has to bring her abdomen up around to the secondary organ. The sperm originally came from here, but the males put it here. And he then uses this sort of fake penis that he has to transfer the sperm to the female. And this is called, as I said, just to review it, the male holds the female, the female collects sperm. This is called being in wheel, or the wheel posture, because you can see it's like a circle. You'll often see dragonflies doing this. Now, why go to all this trouble? First of all, it may prevent different species from breeding with each other. Because in a lot of damselflies, less in dragonflies, a male's claspers, the thing he grabs the female behind the neck with, can only fit into the female's neck of his own species. It's like a lock and key. If it's the wrong shape lock, the key won't go in. So this keeps damselflies from mating with the wrong species. But there may be other reasons for them to do this. In fact, one, people, one theory is that the way this may have gotten started was, remember, these are predators, and they are cannibals. So you remember what happens to a male mantis when he tries to mate with a female? The female eats him while they're mating, which I'm very glad we don't do. <laughs> so a male damselfly or dragonfly would like to avoid this fate. So by getting a hammerlock on the female's head first, she can't get at him now. He's got her by the base of the neck, and he can hang on to her as long as he wants while she mates. So we, some people think this whole mechanism may have evolved so that male damselflies wouldn't be eaten by female damselflies. It's also a way for the male to guard the female from other males. Males are very competitive for females, and in fact, when I talked about this little penis structure that the male has on his secondary sexual organ, it isn't just to add sperm to the female. It's got little hooks and claws, and he reaches in, and if another male has mated with her before, he reaches in, pulls that male sperm packet out, and dumps it 
before replacing it with his own. Some birds do something like that on the other. It's called sperm competition. Now, the next step is egg laying, and with a lot of damselflies, you see the male will actually stay in tandem with the female while she's laying her eggs. Sometimes he even pushes her right underwater. And now, in a lot other a lot of dragonflies, the male will hover above the female. Now, egg laying in, is something you can see quite easily in, in dragonflies and damselflies. Damselflies and some dragonflies lay their eggs in vegetation. Other dragonflies drop their eggs in the water. If you've ever seen a dragonfly above the water, people are always asking, what's that dragonfly doing? Just dipping over the water like this. It's laying eggs. It's dropping eggs in the water. Okay. Now, other things dragonflies do, there are migratory dragonflies. Some dragonflies have very limited ranges and some damselflies, but some dragonflies migrate. This one is interesting. This is the wandering glider. It's the only dragonfly that is found both here and in Canada. It's found, in fact, almost all over the world, and they've been found migrating in thousands, maybe even millions, across the Indian Ocean. They've been seen on the, Mal uh, the ocean off the Maldives. So, probably the ones that migrate in one direction don't migrate back, but there are several kinds of dragonflies that are as good at migrating as some birds and some butterflies are. These are in wheel, again, as you, as you can see. Another thing you'll notice dragonflies doing, and it's the last little bit of behavior I'll show you, is assuming what's called the obelisk posture. Basically, they stand on their heads. And there's been a lot of discussion as to why they do this. Uh, a lot of them are saying that they're doing it in order to take the best advantage of the sun so they can get their bodies in the best position to warm up. But you'll see them do this in rainy days, on cloudy days, so that can't be the only reason. Some of them think it's a display to other males. This particular one, Trithemus aurora, all, does it so extremely it almost seems like it's going to fall over on its head, but uh, it doesn't. But quite often you will see them do this. It's called an obelisk. You all know an obelisk is a big tall column, right? So this looks like an obelisk. Now let's get on to what you came here, which is how do we identify odes? Well, it's fairly easy, as I said, in most cases. But there are some tricks, and like bird watching, or butterfly watching, or plant watching, there's a bit of a learning curve. So let's start with names. You've heard me spout a few, and probably gone a little, oh my gosh, because I use scientific names. This is Orthothemus pulcherima. Pulcherica, pulcherima means very beautiful. So you're going to have to learn, I'm sorry to tell you this, some scientific names. Now why? Why not have do what we do with birds or butterflies and use English names? Well, the problem is that not all of the odonates in Borneo have English names. There's no official list or anything like that. And a lot of them have more than one name. They're called something in India that's different from what they're called in Singapore, which is different from what they're called in Australia. So this one, which is Seriagrion serino rebellum, which means having a cherry like spot on its rear end, is sometimes called the ornate coral tail sometimes called the orange-tailed marsh dart. It's also called the bicolored damsel. So if you want to make sure someone else knows what you're talking about, it's better to swallow hard, learn to pronounce seriagrion serino rebellum. <laughs> now, these names are mostly Greek, and it's not as bad as it sounds. I'll just show you what I mean. Because many of the scientists who have named dragonflies take the easy way out. They'll use the same part of the name and just add something on to the beginning of it. So you just for instance, if you learn Agrion, there you've got three, at least three dragonfly genera already have learned Seriagrion, Asiagrion, and Sudagrion. If you learn Gomphus, you've got Ictinodomphus and Perpagomphus. And or Themis, you can have Neurothemis, Orthothemis, Trithemis, Tetrothemis. There's even one called Pornothemis. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> Yeah, and they mean something. Agrion is a word that means living in the fields or wild, so it's just these things live in the open. Gomphus means nail or peg, and that's just the shape of the body of like a little nail, it's long and narrow. And Themis was the Greek goddess of order, and why that's part of the dragonfly name, I have the faintest idea, but most of these names were dreamt up by European scientists about 200 years ago, and they didn't tell us why. Now, 
Just like when you go birding and you have to learn the parts of a bird, you're going to have to learn some of the parts of a dragonfly. Now, if you know anything about insects, you know that insect bodies come in three parts. The head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And that the thorax has a couple of different sections, let's not worry about them. The six legs are all on the thorax. The abdomen always has ten segments. You'll hear people talk about markings on it at S9 or S10. It's basically between these last two segments. And then at the end, is there are the genitals, which are the Circe and the Epiphox, so we'll come to those later. But you have to learn the face is here, that's a pretty easy word, eye. And quite often a lot of them have stripes along the side of the thorax. The color and shape of those stripes can be important for identification. And here they call lateral thoracic stripes, which just means they're on the side of the thorax. Damsel flies similarly. You have the head. The thorax with the wings and the legs attached. The abdomen, you have these stripes, and then in damsel flies, they're so important they give them names. Mid dorsal along the middle of the back. Anti humeral in front of the shoulder. Humeral along the shoulder. They all need something. And then the ten segments and the genitalia. Yeah. Any dragonfly book you pick up will have these diagrams or something like that. It's very important to be able to tell a male dragonfly from a female dragonfly. And by the way, you get a whole bunch more names for you to learn if you really want uh, I won't go through them here. But the main thing is that, oops, sorry, the male has this plaster that we told about, the surface, that he grabs the female behind the neck with, and underneath it is another organ called the epicrot. The female has a much, usually much bigger, because it's involved in egg laying, and often spines or spikes down here on the ovipositor. That's what it is. Also, female dragonflies often have thicker bodies than males. The males are usually slender, the females are usually probably the back eggs. And these can be very important for identification. The shape of the claspers on the male can be very useful. Now, this, interestingly enough, this is a dragonfly. Look at the size of the claspers on this thing that he grabs the female with. This is a dragonfly that, interestingly enough, I photographed this one near Kuala Lumpur. It's known from West Malaysia and Palawan. It's never been found in Borneo. So maybe it's here, we don't know. But uh, I want to show you those books. But ah, sorry about that. But you can see it in a damselfly, you have to really look very closely to see these parts. Usually, you have to catch the dragonfly, which is not something I do. Uh, or get an extremely close up photograph to show these different features because, as you can see in this lower picture, just a slight difference, these are two North American damselflies, is about the only way that some damselflies that tell them apart are minor differences in the shapes of the female genitalia. In this case, a little bigger in this species, a little smaller in this one. Most times that's not pretty good. Some, and I'll show you some, you really have to do this if you want to know exactly which species you're doing. Now, some dragonflies and damselflies are sexually dimorphic, like birds. The males and the females are in different colors. That's not always true, but it's often awesome enough true. For instance, this one, this is Prochthemus sublilia. It's a very beautiful dragonfly. The male is bright red, the female much duller. Females are much harder to identify, at least for me, than males are. Here's a male and female, you can see them of. Nanophia boitea, that's a dragonfly I'm hoping to see tomorrow at Sama Jaya. It's probably the smallest dragonfly in the world. Very, very tiny. And the, the female looks something like a bee or a wasp. Maybe imitating one. Whereas the male, and other focus back here, you'll see a bit later, is bright red because it wants to be able to display to other males. This is quite often the case with butterflies, too. That females will imitate other insects to avoid being eaten. Males have to attract the female and keep off rival males, so they have to be brightly colored and identified. Now, another difference you have to learn is tenorals versus adults. A tenoral dragonfly is a dragonfly that has just come up out of the water and broken out of its shell and hasn't yet had a chance to dry out completely and take on its adult colors. So you can see this is a kind of damselfly. It starts out like this, this pale whitish thing. And then eventually, in maybe a day or so, it will acquire these quite bright colors. So it 
sometimes you find these little whitish pale things which say, wow, are they? And that's just because they haven't yet developed their full color scheme. Another little thing that you have to learn is that some dragonflies, as they get older, some dragonflies, too, mostly dragonflies, develop a waxy or powdery coating on them, usually blue, sometimes white. It's called pruinosity or pruinescence. And uh, you can see these two dragonflies. This is uh, one that becomes almost entirely blue. This I, is a very strange individual. It seems to have lost most of that powdery coating on it. I'm still not sure if I've identified it correctly, but I think it's the same species as this one. It's just lost that coating. This is, by the way, is what it looks like under an electron microscope. It apparently keeps water off. And usually, dragonflies spend a lot of time near water, and they're covered with wax. And this is a little extra wax that helps keep repel water to keep them dry. Now, probably the part other than wearing the bits of the genitalia that might scare you off the most is learning about the veins and the wings of dragonflies. Dragonflies and damselflies have different patterns of wing venation, the pattern of the wings, and this can be very important in telling what family you're dealing with and which species. Now, most of the dragonflies that you will see, you can look at the color and the shape and the size, and you don't have to worry about that. But sometimes you do. And I find the easiest way to do this is to take a photograph, and then you can compare the details with the book later. So we've developed all kinds of fancy names for the bits of wing venation on a dragonfly. The only ones that are really critical, I think, for you to know is Almost all, all dragonflies and almost all damselflies have a dark patch. Sometimes it's bright yellow or orange, but usually it's dark. Right up here, which is either called a stigma or a pterostigma, which just means a stigma. Stigma means like a wound or a mark, and tero is the wing. So you have to look for that. Also, the middle of the wing, there's a little point at which the wing seems to break. That's the notice. And there's another thing here called a triangle. You can see it here. And you can see it here. There's some other ones that I'm not going to worry about them now. As I say, as you begin to learn about these things, these will become more important. Most of you who are going on the walk tomorrow can probably ignore this. But it is something dragonfly watchers have to learn to deal with. It's like trying to tell a couple of very difficult warders or partners. Now, I, as a scientist, you have to ask sometimes why do they have all these complicated patterns and differences? It apparently has something to do with, and there's been very recent studies about this, as to how the wing bends in flight. Remember, any insect or any animal that flies is fighting against the air. And the wing is going to bend slightly and change shape as it flaps up and down. In technical terms, it deforms. And the wing has to be strong enough to be able to bend in just the right way, and yet not break, and hold together and make the right shapes out of the airfoil of the wing so the animal can actually fly. And we think that's what these little bits of venation are for. That they strengthen the wing and they allow it to bend in just the right places so that it can fly. Now, in, as here's an example of one of these peculiar little places where you really have to know what you're doing. There's a large genus of dragonflies called Orthetra. And some of them are bright red. And there's lots of other dragonflies that are also bright red. And you're probably going to say, oh, it's a red dragonfly, and then you're going to be horrified to discover that there's about half a dozen of them. Which is it? And when you get your camera, pick your photographs home, and I, photography's a big part of it, you can have a look, if you really are that touchy, at this little bit. You see, I remember I talked about the notice, the node, where the wing seems to break. But right before that is the antinode, and you can see that in this one, it doesn't, this little vein doesn't go all the way across. In orthetrum, it always does go all the way across. So if you're trying to figure out whether a dragonfly is an orthetrum or not, you look at that. And again, please don't let that scare you off. It's not as bad as it sounds. So what are you going to need? You're going to need field guides. Now part of the problem here is we really don't have a good, thorough field guide to dragonflies of Borneo. We do have this book. A Guide of the Dragonflies of Borneo by uh, Sandy Orr. The problem is, it was written about 15 years ago, and it's way out of date. We now know that there are several dragonflies in Borneo that are here but aren't in the book. We know that there's been a lot of work, particularly by Dr. Rory Dow and his colleagues, to show that there are many other species, newly discovered, newly described species in Borneo that aren't in the book. The other book 
is uh, also by the same author, is this little guy, which is a nice field one to carry. This is quite a big book. Uh, this is a guide to the dragonflies of Peninsular Malaysia and Borneo, uh, and Singapore, excuse me. It, but many of the dragonflies of Borneo are also in this book. So this is a very handy, I carry this everywhere, little pocket guide to show you what species to look for. And as long as you know which ones are Borneo and which ones aren't, and they can tell you, it does tell you, uh, you can use this to help learn. So you guys should be selling them up the back of them. <laughs> now, there's also a very nice book on the dragonflies of Singapore, which has lots of beautiful photographs instead of drawings, and uh, also has a special section at the back on how to tell all the blue dragonflies apart and how to tell all the red dragonflies apart. Very useful and a nice book, but it's just Singapore. And if you go on the internet and you get really interested in finding out all the new discoveries, you can download most of Dr. Dow's and others' scientific papers, which tell you with lots of color pictures usually which dragonflies have been found in places like Cuba and Borneo Highlands. And all you have to do is Google dragonflies, Borneo Islands, or dragonflies in Cuba, and you can probably come up with these scientific papers, which aren't that technical. They're mostly lists of what they found up there with pictures of many of them. So they're worth downloading. There's a lot about the old data on the internet. I do not expect you to write down or note all of these things. The only thing, there's, there is this site, All Odonata, which is a picture collection from all over the world of dragonflies and dragonflies. Very handy. But if you look, you can see that almost every country in Southeast Asia, someone's got a blog about dragonflies and dragonflies. Malaysia, Singapore, Sabah, Thailand, Kalimantan, Vietnam, Cambodia. All you have to do is go on the web. Now, is this still working? <laughs> All you have to do is go on the web, Google a country, put in the word dragonfly or damselfly, and you'll probably get a blog with lots of color pictures and advice as to how to identify and where to find a dragonfly. I particularly recommend this one because it's my blog, uh, which is not just about dragonflies, but I can use all the readers on. Now, what are you going to need? This is me photographing the dragonfly. Actually, again, not the morning on the frame. This is a Bogor Botanic Garden. This is Java. We need to go photograph courtesy of my wife, my name, and Jim Platt. You will need, no, you don't need anything, all right? You can get close enough to the dragonfly to look at it and say, oh, ho. Oh. But it certainly does help to have binoculars. I think the camera is extremely useful because. If you want to see those fine details, it's often much easier to photograph it, come home, get the photograph up on your screen, and then use the book to figure out what it is. So, and I like to use a, a telephoto, what I like to use is a telephoto lens, and I can get a couple of extension tubes, which allow you to focus more closely, or if you have a macro lens, you can use that. But you, you don't think it's close to the telephoto. But I, I do this all the time. A lot of people like to catch the insects. They seem not to keep them as specimens, but to get a close look at sometimes the genital organs. I said in some species, if you don't do that, you can't identify them. So those people will bring an insect net and a magnifying glass. I don't do that. I, I guess I sort of feel that I don't need to know that badly what specific insects are to possibly risk injury. But if you're doing scientific studies, of course you have to do that. And if anybody wants to bring an insect net along tomorrow, feel free. I, I don't mind. Um, but that, I do think of that as optimal equipment for all the very few species that you can't identify unless you have them. Now, just like birds and butterflies, dragonflies are arranged in families. And there aren't very many fortunately, so I think it's a good idea to give you a little introduction to the main families. Uh, now, there's one family which will come to the end that has almost every dragonfly you're going to see here, but there are a few others. First, we have this family of darters, or hawk. They call them darters in North America because this long, long body was thought to look like what you call a darning needle, which was used for sewing. In fact, there are people who believe that dragonflies could sew their lips shut. And for anybody who believes that, you know they can. Or they don't. And uh, hawkers, what they call them in Europe, the hawkers, because these are dragonflies that are very frustrating because they do most of their hunting in flight. They very rarely land. 
So uh, they're, they're miserable for photographers because they're trying to get a photograph of something that is zooming back and forth in front of you all the time. And uh, so I don't do the photos. That's why of these three photos, only one of them is by me. This, this one from the Orient Islands. It's a female. You see these big, long, long structures in the back. This one is a fantastic insect. I'd love to get a photo of it. This is Indisha of Gruvaurai, and the best place to see that is at the Frog Pond at the top. You get there around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This is a very large dragonfly. They'll, they'll come down, zoom around the pond once or twice, and head off in the woods again. I've never gotten a photo of one, but they're extremely spectacular. This is the one we may see at Summer Giant tomorrow. It's the one of these families that likes to be in open country as opposed to in the forest. But when they perch, Garners usually hang vertically down. How a dragonfly sits with lands can be refused for a family of walls. So they perch vertically and they lay their eggs, as this one is doing, in vegetation. They can actually burrow into the stem of a plant or into rotten wood and they lay their eggs there instead of just dropping their eggs in the water. Now, one way you can tell a member of this family from any other family if you want to get fancy is again the wing venation. You see this little structure here is called the triangle. You see this triangle on the front wing and this triangle behind wing are about the same. That means it's a member of the garter family, the eastern wing. Whereas on this one, you can see that this is very long and narrow, this is short and stout, so it belongs to one of the other families. Now also, uh, although dragonflies are usually creatures of sunshine and warmth, there are some night flying dragonflies, and most of these belong to this family, Ishmael. And in fact, uh, no, as a matter of fact, this one is not, this is another family. But to give you an idea of how these things hide from us, this one this is a female, you'll see the male later, but I photographed on the wall of my apartment in Green Heights. This one, I, it's not my photo, but I have a very similar one, was in the lobby of Green Heights. And this one, I found across the street dead outside of Chop us. And as a matter of fact, I want to look at it. Now, so you can look at it later. Now, this has a horrible name, Tetra Tenthina, which means it's got four spines on its genitals. Now, can you say that again? Tetra Tenthina. It means it's got four spines on its rear end. Okay. Now, <laughs> the interesting thing, I'm not sure exactly which species this is because there are three or four in Borneo and the book is too clear as to how to tell them apart. But the one I know that it isn't is a species called Tetracanthogyna plagiata, which is interesting because it's probably the biggest dragonfly in the world. So Borneo has the distinction of having both probably the biggest dragonfly in the world and the smallest dragonfly in the world. So we, we span the gap. These come out at dusk on fly around lights. If you see one, always a good idea to get a flash with some photographs. Now, the next family we're going to talk about are the club tails from Gomphidae. Most of these are named names in Gomphus. And the main thing about these guys is that the, the eyes don't meet in the middle of the head. Remember I told you there are some dragonflies like that. And the males usually have a big swollen club at the end of the tail. They normally perch horizontally. This is the only one that you're really likely to find commonly around here. It's a big dragonfly. We may see them tomorrow at the time. Uh, I've seen them in the sea forest and other places. It's, it, it's pretty common. It's, uh, if you see a big black dragonfly with yellow rings around it, both of them are probably this. The other species all tend to do in forest streams, and I find them very hard to find. Them. Now, there, these are two smaller families, and there are only a few of each in Borneo. I'm showing them just to complete this. Uh, these are not my photographs. I've never found.